So <clears throat> let's get into it then, asset protection. And I guess the question we should ask ourselves is, how do we deal with this risk? And of course it's by having the right structure. So I want you to pause and reflect for a moment, how does liability actually attach to your personal asset base? Because as a process, if you can understand how the liability is going to attach to the assets, it's pretty easy to remove the assets from the liability. And who, who's self-employed at the moment? Can I have a quick show of hands? Okay. And to everyone else who's not self-employed, I'm just speaking to those people now, okay, the people that aren't self-employed, who of those people that are not self-employed are going to trade properties? Right, that's the rest of you, isn't it? And of course, if you're trading properties, are you becoming self-employed? So are you all self-employed? Great. So I'm speaking to everybody here. So risk as a sole trader. First thing you need to realise is that if you trade in your own name, there's no separation from of the risk and the assets. Look at Joe Smith trading in Smith's trucks. Simple little Kiwi business. He's got his house, his investments, and he trades in his own name. Because let's say he doesn't make very much money, so his accountant says there's no need to get flash and form companies and that sort of thing because there's no tax advantage. More skewed advice from an accountant coming here. They're just thinking about tax. Have a look what happens when one of Joe Smith's employees drives the truck drunk and writes off a bunch of expensive assets that are on the back of the truck. We now lose the trucking business, but because with the trucking business is the house and the investments, those go as well. So simple point here, never trade as a sole trader. Even if you're not making very much money, you're not getting asset protection. There's something worse than a sole tradership, and that, of course, is a partnership. And if you've got any two people trading a business together, the thing about a partnership is you have a, a deemed partnership and you become jointly and severally liable. And what that means is that each of you in the partnership are 100% liable. Okay, so you're liable separately and you're liable together. So once again, from the accountant, the accountant might say, this is quite tax efficient because we can income split to a spouse without getting IRD's permission to do that. And from a tax perspective, that might be true. But from an asset protection perspective, these structures are disasters. So if anybody in this room is in a partnership, I would suggest that you need to be revisiting that and considering what the alternatives are to get better asset protection. Stay out of them. So here's Peter Jones and Joe Smith. In the example, Peter's got 100 grand, Joe Smith's got $10 million. They've got together because they're mates, but Peter's caused the $10 million with a liability. Now think, if I was acting for the creditors as an insolvency practitioner, I would say to the creditors, oh look, these two guys, Peter and Joe, they've harmed you. Let's have a look at them. So we'd whip down to the company's office and we'd get a list of assets, uh, sorry, directorships and shareholdings that pop up for both Peter and Joe. Then we'd go down to the land transfer office and we'd get a list of properties in the name of Peter and Joe and all the directorships and shareholdings they hold would go to those companies and work out what properties are in there. We'd trace the assets to the individuals. That would probably take us half a day to do that. And then we'd sit back and say, right, who's got all the money here? It doesn't take us very long to work out that Joe Smith's got a bunch of cash and Peter Jones doesn't, so we're going to go after Joe Smith even if it was Peter that did the wrong. So just have a think about that. That's the effect of a partnership on the way the creditors deal with you. They're the fattest to the skinniest.